What did the robber look like? He, he looked like her dad. Can you help me? My wife is dead. Okay. Is she breathing at all? Nothing? No, got me, got me. Okay, is she beyond CPR? Yes. Yes. In September 2015, the horrific murder of 35-year-old Kelly Clayton was made public in Caton, New York, and it had a devastating impact on the neighborhood. Cullen and Charlie were Kelly's two children. She was Thomas Clayton's wife, a hockey player. The unexpected presence of Kelly's seven-year-old daughter as an eyewitness added to the case's chill factor. The tragic incident revolves around Thomas Clayton, a Binghamton native who spent four seasons with the Elmira Jackals hockey team. He joined the Jackals as a forward late in their second season, right out of Niagara University, where he played hockey for four seasons, from 1998 to 2002. You always want to fight someone, just like when you're a little kid and you get so mad you just want to fight, you know? After retiring from hockey, Clayton owned a business franchise, Paul Davis Emergency Services of the Southern Tier, a fire and water damage restoration firm. Clayton later became project manager at Serve Pro, a similar franchise owned locally by his longtime friend and fellow Binghamton native. Michael Beard was a laborer who lived in Elmira Heights. He worked for Clayton at Paul Davis and also worked for a time at Serve Pro. Beard also rented an apartment in the village of Elmira Heights that was owned by Clayton. Beard was familiar with the layout of Clayton's home in rural southeastern Steuben County as Clayton often had him over to do odd jobs around his property. Kelly Clayton, who is the victim, and also the wife of Thomas Clayton. After receiving a 911 call on September 29, 2015, the town of Catan's local officials discovered Kelly dead from beating in the kitchen of her own house at 2181 Ginnon Road. Is she breathing at all? Nothing? No, trust me, trust me. Okay, is she beyond CPR? Yes. yes. Thomas Clayton, Kelly Clayton's husband, reported that he had arrived home from a poker game and discovered her body on the kitchen floor. It was Thomas Clayton who dialed 911. Two Steuben County police officers had to go through a horrific crime scene after making the 911 call. Something that looked too horrible to be true was captured on camera by a police officer donning a body cam. It turned out to be Kelly Clayton's corpse. After bringing the children to the neighbor's house, Thomas called 911. How you doing? I'm okay. What's going on? Um, I'm just came, I'm the neighbor. He okay. came and got me out of bed. There's, there's, he's right in the house. Okay, what happened? His wife, his wife is in there. Anybody else in the house, Tom? Just you? No, I got the kids. They're at the neighbor's house. Okay, where's she at? Tom, where were you when this all went down? Playing poker with my buddy. Okay. She was home alone? I came home and my daughter said there was a robber in the house and she saw them. Let me see your hands real quick, man. You ain't hurt or anything? Okay, good. Okay. Upon entering Clayton's home, Deputy Swan discovered Thomas kneeling. They conversed briefly, but Thomas was unable to explain what had occurred or what the officer was about to witness. Nobody tried CPR. Kelly had already passed away, according to the paramedics who arrived. No, she got blood on the wall, blood on the steps. Looks like she was attacked in bed. There's blood all over. She's been dragged. Blood on the wall. Blood with a hole in the wall. Looks like a face plant into the wall. The entire house was filled with violence. The attack appeared to be well documented by the damage and blood splatter. Kelly would have been in bed in the upper bedroom when there was first a commotion. There were broken objects scattered all over the upstairs hallway and frames that had been smashed to the ground. It appeared that the wall at the foot of the staircase had been struck with a heavy blow because of the large dent in it. Kelly was discovered in the lower level kitchen after a blood trail from the bedroom extended all the way there. Although the murder weapon was not found right away. Chill out there, man. Let me see your hands real quick, man. You ain't hurt or anything? Okay, good. Okay. I want you to have a seat. You don't need to see that anymore, okay? Just take some deep breaths, okay? I know. Yeah. Just take some deep breaths and stuff. Just try to stay calm. Well, sit down, man. Come on over here and sit down.
This was not an attack with a knife or pistol. The residence was carefully searched to make sure that nobody, not even the invader, was still inside when further responding Steuben County Sheriff Department officers arrived. A few crucial elements became evident right away as the officer processed the situation in front of them. No signs of forced entry were present. We got a crime scene here, a possible homicide. Nobody's going in right now. We got to clear this house. To cover me, I'm going to go upstairs. I got to go up and clear it. They're over here, the kids' rooms are over here. There's blood in the kids' room. Okay, kids' rooms, this one's clear. Trying not to step on anything. Okay, clear. Let's get the hell off this. House is clear. I got a female, mid 30s, early 40s, completely beaten in. Husband's story right now. Kids were home with mom. Husband's claiming he was out playing poker. Came home. Kid said, Daddy, there was a robbery. Yeah, there's blood all over. She's been dragged. In reality, the house's tour came to a stop at the garage where an intact side outside door was sitting wide open. The appearance of a break in was not present. Thomas Clayton's habitual gambling was evident in the abundance of cash in the house, yet his safes remained unopened. Responding law enforcement officials thought they were dealing with a murder case. When Tom held his hands up to the cops, there were no wounds on display, nor was there any blood on him anywhere. I want to make sure there's no forced entry anywhere else. I didn't see any. Did you see any? I didn't see any when I was in there. I'm wondering if he had a domestic with her. She face planted. Yeah. Boom, boom. Then he puts her on the kitchen. In her face, you can see how her face is beat in. Husband? Husband. As responders came, the area was bustling with increased action within an hour. As night gave way to rainy dawn, K-9 units searched the home and its environs, directing teams to a pond at the back. In order to collect evidence, the pond was first skimmed and then emptied. Several agencies were brought into the case, with Captain Eric Tyner serving as the lead investigator. Leading the charge was the Steuben County Sheriff's Office, and Tyner oversaw the extensive investigation that was especially important for the town of Caton. Through interviewing Kelly's friends and family as part of their inquiry, they discovered that she was having trouble with her husband, Thomas Clayton, and had been thinking about getting a divorce. Thomas was taken in for questioning that day, but there was also one other crucial witness that investigators needed to speak with. Seven-year-old Charlie and her little brother Cullen were both at home at the time of the attack. Although it's believed that Cullen was not directly exposed to what had occurred, Charlie, the sole witness to her mother's murder, told the investigators that she had seen a man hurting her mom while her mom told her to run away. Charlie did run, but not out of the house. She ran to her brother's room to protect him. Later, she went to her mother and hugged her leg. She described the assailant as having eyes like her dad. Um, there was blood everywhere. Okay. Um, on my door, on the floor, not on the carpet, though. And I thought she was dead when she was lying on the ground. And Daddy was out by cards. We were basically alone for like, like 20 minutes. Then he came home and he was like, oh my god. Because he saw my county sheriff jim allard said he knew he needed to bring in a child forensic investigator to help talk to the girl about what happened a second police interview took place at the chemung county child advocacy center where charlie gave an account of how the assailant was putting on her dad's mask and jeans every question she was asked related to her dad can you tell me what he looked like like, he was wearing jeans, a black long sleeve shirt, and a mask. Okay. What did the robber look like? He, he looked like my dad. And, and why do you say that? How did he look like your dad? The mask and his shoes. How about the size of him? Was he a big, big guy, or was he a little guy? The size of my dad. Did the robber say anything? He probably didn't say anything because what if it was my daddy, he could, re he could recognize his voice. The sequence of events, as Charlie was able to describe, aligned with the story told by the evidence inside the house. 
A brutal struggle had started in the bedroom and escalated downstairs to the kitchen. Investigators then turned to extracting as much physical information about the attacker from the little girl as they could. The young girl's statement seemed to verify exactly what officers at the scene had suspected within minutes, that Thomas Clayton was responsible for the murder of his wife although not exactly a firm idea of their prime suspect. Police took the seven-year-old statement as confirmation of fact and, by extension, probable cause, and after several hours of questioning, they arrested Thomas Clayton for second-degree murder on October 2, 2015. Despite the arrest, the investigation continued. There were a lot of missing pieces, and central among them was a motive for Thomas wanting his beautiful wife and the mother of his children dead. Close friends of the couple related the same perspective that they appear to be happy and very much in love. Kelly, after ten years and two children, regularly spoke of how lucky she was in her marriage and grateful to have found such a great catch as husband. It was Kelly's sixteen-year-old niece who first told investigators that there was another side to Thomas Clayton. The teenager had spent the summer working for Thomas Clayton at ServPro, and during that time, she said Thomas spoke to her about the state of his marriage. He said he was not in love with his wife. He told her beautifully that he had had multiple affairs, and critically, he said that he could not divorce Kelly, because if he did, he would lose everything. Then, of course, there was the life insurance taken out on Kelly, which was doubled in the months leading up to the murder to a potential payout of a million dollars to Thomas. As more of Thomas's friends and colleagues were questioned, a similar story was emerging. Many women claimed that they had had a sexual relationship with Thomas and that he complained to them about his wife. He called her lazy, ungrateful, and a bitch. These relationships were verified, and cell phone records indicated that even as Thomas was exchanging seemingly loving text messages with Kelt, only a few days before her murder, Steuben County. Sheriff's investigators had what they assessed as a domestic dispute gone too far. They had an eyewitness describing a masked man resembling their suspect, and they had won both personally and financially for motive. As Thomas Clayton was interrogated, he told police he was at a friend's house for a weekly poker game, an alibi corroborated by others with him that night. But information came yet again from the young niece of the Claytons. She told the police that there was one man named Michael Beard who had worked at Serpro for Thomas while she was there in the summer, but had recently been fired. Investigators came to learn that Michael had been fired at Servpro by Thomas after working at his first company, but had just been fired about a week and a half prior. Michael was found to have stolen items from people's homes while performing remediation work and co-workers complained that he had been drinking on the job with no income forthcoming and was behind on his rent. Michael's landlord was in the process of evicting him and his family from their home. In a cruel twist of fate, Michael's landlord was also his former boss, none other than Thomas Clayton. Michael was brought in for questioning and asked about his feelings towards Thomas. He claimed he had no ill will toward his former employer. On the contrary, Thomas had repeatedly sought to get him to work both at his companies and doing odd jobs at his house. Kelly had been kind to him and his co-worker. She had made them lunches while at the house and had even gifted Michael hand-me-down clothing from Charlie for his daughter. Following the interview, the police had no outstanding concerns about Michael Beard. He was free to go. That was after his first interview. Perceptions changed rapidly after investigators spoke with Michael's wife, Holly. He also took a polygraph test and failed. Also, investigators learned that a woman there said Thomas asked to borrow her cell phone to make a call just 90 minutes before he got home to find his wife's body. That call was placed to Beard around 10.50 p.m., according to police. Beard's partner told police that the couple was fighting that night and Beard left around 11.30 p.m. and returned about an hour and a half later. Michael was interviewed. However, it wasn't recorded. Reports later described how Michael was confronted by the investigators and compelled to give a full confession. He admitted that he went to Clayton's house that night 
with the intention of burning it down. He had a set of keys to the house. He used these to enter the side door of the garage and made his way inside. There were gas canisters already in the garage. He planned to use these to set the house ablaze, but when he got there, he surprised Kelly in the bedroom, and the subsequent altercation and bloody fight scared him, and he lost his nerve. Following the struggle, he left her on the kitchen floor and rushed from the house back to his vehicle without setting the fire. The case became tense as Michael Beard got arrested. Michael Beard's DNA was found inside the house. Swabs taken from blood stains on the doorway to Charlie's room indicated that Michael was there at the time of the murder, as his confession claimed. He was also able to outline to the police where they could locate the murder weapon and other items connected to the attack. Police searched in a covert on East 14th Street at the Elmira Heights Horseheads border for a few hours. They used what looked like a metal detector in the area. They eventually pulled out a small object and placed it in an evidence bag. The Steuben County Sheriff's Office said items of interest were also near Hall Street in the city of Elmira regarding the case. Information on what was found at both locations was not released. They located the yellow handle of a mall in the bush just off the roadside of State Route 225, where Michael had to throw it out of the window of his vehicle after feeling the scene. The handle matched a piece found inside the house amongst the bloody murder scene. Michael's co-worker, with whom he had worked on Clayton's property, identified the handle as from a mall that had broken one day prior when they were both at the house. In Elmira Heights, the state police were able to dig up a bag full of Michael's clothing from a swampy location. These items tested positive for containing Kelly's blood. Keys to the house were retrieved from a shallow creek. Michael's detailed confession was further supported by his recruited accomplice, a man named Mark Blandford. Mark claimed he did not know what was going to transpire that night when Michael came to pick him up from his house. He said he had been drinking, and he was instructed to be on the lookout outside the house while Michael did something inside. Michael picked him up in a maroon truck. They drove out to the house in Caton, and Mark watched while Michael retrieved something, a pipe-shaped object, from the back of the vehicle. He was gone for some time, but when he returned, he was visibly shaken and out of breath. There was little doubt that the masked man who killed Kelly was Michael Bears and not her husband, Thomas. However, upon hearing of Kelly's murder, Linda Miller, known as Lucky in their poker circle, recalled a curious detail from the night that Kelly died. Thomas had requested to use her phone that evening around 11 p.m., he claimed that his cell phone was left sitting in his van so he could use hers alone. This was a small favor. What raised red flags for Linda was what she pieced together afterward. First, despite hearing Thomas muffle a conversation on her phone in the adjoining room before returning it to her, she found no history of a call being placed on her phone at that time. Whatever number Thomas had dialed, he promptly deleted it. Adding to Linda's suspicions, was the shared observation made by the other poker players that night that Thomas had in fact had his cell phone with him at the table all night. So why lie to Linda? Linda's call records showed that Thomas failed two numbers from her cell phone. The first was the fax machine, which was a single-digit variation of Michael Beard's phone number. The second call was connected to Michael Beard. Investigators conducted extensive forensic analysis of the crime scene, including analyzing blood spatters and prints found at the home. Further investigation revealed that Clayton had hired Beard to carry out the murder. They had communicated through texts, calls, and emails, and on the day of the murder, Clayton had purchased a throwaway phone to use during the crime. Clayton had also made internet searches on how to hire a hitman. Michael Beard stood trial first when he took the stand in his own defense. The top count of first-degree murder was applicable if the jury accepted that Michael was hired to commit the murder. During the prosecution, Michael Beard gave testimony that he had been hired by Clayton to carry out the murder and was paid $10,000 for his services. He also admitted to striking Kelly with a baseball bat while Clayton waited in the car outside the home. However, he recanted his confession 
and he could no longer be used as a key witness in the case against Thomas. The state needed to show proof that Michael was hired by Thomas in some other way, but no money was ever exchanged. The $10,000 allegedly promised to Michael had never materialized. No incriminating conversations between the two men were ever overheard. Text messages between the two dealt with work-related topics, some of which were notably cryptic, but they did not confirm any agreement to murder Kelly. In that phone call from Linda Miller's phone, Thomas claimed to have called Michael, offering him some work for the next day and helping a player at the poker table move some deer blinds that he purchased. The prosecution called Say Ray, a former police officer who runs a business that uses software to aggregate data from multiple sources, such as GPS data, phone company records, and Calm Tower information, in order to track the whereabouts and movements of active cell phones at any given moment. Using that information, Ray made maps that depicted Beard's and Thomas Clayton's whereabouts on the days preceding the murder. Additionally, the information revealed that Michael departed his house just before 11 p.m. on September 28th, right after he received a phone call from Thomas during the poker game. GPS data also traced Thomas to a local business, M&M Auto, at about noon on the day leading up to the murder. He stopped in to use the business's phone, saying he was unable to get a signal on his cell phone. Records obtained from that business line showed a call to Michael placed at that time, which lasted just over a minute, and security footage from Michael's apartment building, as well as the ServPro parking lot, began to fill in the gaps. Thomas had arranged two switch vehicles the day before the murder, and another employee, Luca Tatralt, the same worker who identified the murder weapon, showed up at Thomas's house on Saturday in his red pickup truck to collect a four-wheeler for a weekend event. On Monday, Thomas offered to swap trucks with Luca for the day. Thomas would unload the four-wheeler at home and return Luca's truck the following day, instead of unloading it from his truck to Thomas's. ServPro's surveillance footage conveniently revealed that Thomas had unloaded the four-wheeler at home, left the red pickup truck in the lot at around six o'clock, and then driven a Surf Pro truck to the poker session that evening. Following Thomas's phone call, Michael Beard left his house, rode a bicycle that Thomas had bought him to the Surf Pro lot, picked up Luca's red truck, and drove away. After dropping off Mark Bradford shortly after 12.30 a.m., security footage once more revealed. Thomas's trial saw 75 witnesses, 400 pieces of evidence submitted by the prosecution, and six full weeks of testimony. It took the jury just six hours to reach a verdict. Thomas was convicted of first-degree murder. Thomas's defense team appeared shocked by the decision. They continued to insist that no concrete evidence existed to link Thomas to a plot to hire Michael Beard. His lawyer pointed to his polygraph test, which showed he was telling the truth about not being responsible for Kelly's death. The murder of Kelly Clayton was a tragic and devastating event for her family and friends. She was a beloved mother, wife, and realtor, who was known for her kindness, generosity, and strong work ethic. Her family and friends were shocked and saddened by her senseless murder. In the aftermath of the murder, Kelly's family released a statement expressing their grief and requesting privacy. They wrote, Our family is absolutely devastated by the loss of Kelly. She was a wonderful mother, an amazing wife, and a dear friend to so many. We appreciate all of the support we have received and ask that you please respect our privacy during this difficult time. Additionally, local community members and colleagues of Kelly's expressed their shock about her violent and brutal demise. They shared that Kelly was a respected and dedicated real estate agent for whom colleagues had high regard. They were devastated that she was taken away from them so abruptly. Since the conviction of Thomas Clayton and Michael Beard for the murder of Kelly Clayton, the family has not made many public statements. However, they did release a statement thanking the police and the prosecution for their efforts in bringing the perpetrators to justice. Overall, the family of Kelly Clayton has been deeply impacted by the murder, and they continue to grieve her loss. Her senseless death left a permanent mark on both her personal and professional communities.
On February 23, 2017, Thomas was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. He is serving his life sentence at Sing Sing Prison in Ossining, New York. Michael Beard was also found guilty of both first-degree and second-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole and is serving time at Auburn Correctional Facility.